Hi everyone. In a surprising turn of events, my Twitter account has been reinstated, so I have been unbanned. Even though when I was banned I had filed an appeal and been denied, I guess they decided to reverse course, and I credit everyone who spoke out, so thank you so much, it means a lot. Of course, many people who really shouldn't have been banned remain banned, so we do see that Twitter's decision making is often quite arbitrary and subjective, but at least this time, they seem to have listened to us. I want to talk now a bit about the Yaniv situation and how it's being covered in the mainstream media. A lot of us have been talking about Yaniv since last year, but the publication ban that was put in place by the BC Human Rights Tribunal was just lifted in mid-July. This is why finally there's a lot of media coverage about not only Yaniv's human rights tribunal cases, but who Yaniv is in general. Now, there are a couple of things about the media coverage that I want to point out. Firstly, when the Canadian media covered my Twitter ban, and if you're not familiar with why I was banned in the first place, um, I will link my video about that below in the description. But what I found really telling was that they would print that I called Yaniv an ugly fat man. They would have no problem repeating that. But they would not say that Yaniv said, I have a loose vagina and he has a tight pussy. And of course, we know that I was suspended for what I said, but Yaniv was not suspended or punished in any way for what he said. So, I find it interesting that my remarks were, you know, people had no problem repeating them and saying what they are, but with Yaniv's remarks, they were so vulgar that no one even wanted to repeat them. No one even wanted to publish what they were. They would just say remarks about Lindsay Shepard's genitalia. At the time of my Twitter ban, I was invited on a radio show. I don't really want to say which one, but I was asked not to say Jessica Yaniv's name. I was asked not even to use the initials JY, um, but I was told, I was directed to, to refer to Yaniv as this individual. And this was after the publication ban was lifted, so we were allowed to say Jessica Yaniv's name, or even just JY, but this radio show did not even want me saying JY. Um, and this is because they told me they don't want to get sued, right? Because everyone is so afraid that Yaniv, is, who's extremely litigious, is going to haul them into the Human Rights Tribunal or sue them. And so, you know, is this a reason why a lot of people uh, aren't covering this story? Is because they're so afraid of getting sued? That's pretty awful. And then also a radio show host told me that both my comments and Yaniv's comments were abusive, which I was a little bit taken aback by. But I said to this radio show host, I have zero tolerance for predators. I am not going to be nice to predators. I am not going to be polite to predators. Zero tolerance. End of story. The final media aspect that I want to focus on is a podcast called Canada Land. Now, I'm not sure how influential Canada Land actually is. It does seem to pull a lot of Patreon money, but um, they're known as a leftist media source, and I found their coverage of the Jessica Yaniv situation, frankly, very appalling. This imaginary trans boogeyman now seems to exist, at least to the extreme conservative media around the world who have been putting this person on their airwaves and writing copiously about this person. This person lives in British Columbia. Her name is Jessica Yaniv. Had you been reading about Jessica Yaniv? I know more about this now than I would ever have wanted to. You made me read up on this, Jesse. I'm sorry, because it is, it's a silly and absurd and, and gross and kind of unpleasant story. Silly and absurd? That is so extremely dismissive of the women who were actually hauled into the Human Rights Tribunal by Jessica Yaniv. There was one woman who was a respondent to one of Yaniv's complaints, who was so stressed by the complaint filed against her that she was, um, her mental and physical health, her marriage, her family was impacted. And there was another woman who was a respondent who was pregnant while she was testifying. And keep in mind, this takes up the time, the energy, the mental energy of these women. And the fact that they're immigrants actually matters here because imagine you move to another country and, you know, where you might be less familiar with the judicial and legal processes and systems. And you find out someone has filed an official governmental complaint against you. You'd probably be wondering how severe are the consequences if you're found to have done something wrong. And remember, the women here did nothing wrong. And it is definitely not silly or absurd to be having a conversation about the role 
of human rights tribunals in this country, um, if they are being abused, how gender self-identification works, if gender self-identification is impacting women and girls and in what ways, etc. These are not silly and absurd conversations. These are important conversations. Pete, those transphobic comments were aimed at Jessica Yaniv. Lindsay Shepard, you know, misgendered Jessica Yaniv and, and called her a fat, ugly man and was kicked off of Twitter, which I have no problem with. But it is relevant that Jessica Yaniv, through vulgar, disgusting, misogynistic comments at Lindsay Shepard, like very specifically misogynistic comments mentioning, you know, Lindsay Shepard's genitalia and... Uh, picking up on on like a, a medical issue that Lindsay Shepard had in her in her pregnancy, and you could just as easily kick Jessica Yaniv off of Twitter for misogyny for abuse as you did Lindsay Shepard for transphobia, and that is the point of outrage. That double standard is certainly enraging people in the right in the media. See how he won't even repeat Yaniv's comments. He repeated mine, but not Yaniv's because Yaniv's were more vulgar. And Jessica Yaniv explicitly approached these people and said, I want you to wax my genitalia. And I try to keep an open mind about things. And I think that the idea here, if we are going to consider this activism, is in the tradition of like when desegregation happened, there are black people who intentionally went to racist white restaurants, lunch counters and said, serve me. And that was, a, I think, a very valid form of activism. Or there, more recently, were gay couples who went to bakers who were known to be homophobic bakeries and say, make us a cake. And the idea is, you do not have the right to deny me service. And here's Jessica Yaniv ostensibly taking that idea to its logical extreme and saying, I'm a woman because I say I am, and you're going you're gonna to wax my genitalia even though it is, it is male genitalia. And that is what is outraging the extreme right media. It's less interesting to me to interrogate the actions of Jessica Yaniv for the reasons that you're getting at, right? It's unclear that she speaks for anyone else. It's unclear that she's part of any other activist group. There's been a lot of reporting in the sort of Canadian right-wing media. Lindsay Shepard had her own article about Jessica Yaniv in the Post Millennial yesterday. What's instantly apparent from these clips is how obsessed they are with right-wing media, as if the fact that it's mainly the right-wing media that has picked up on this story somehow delegitimizes the importance of this story. I think we just need to stop seeing the term right-wing as a smear, because it's not a smear. The last thing I'll say is something that I find really unfair here is that it seems like Jessica Yaniv does not have a job or an occupation, because they spend all day reporting stuff on Twitter, searching themselves on the internet, and filing complaints against people, whether that's formally or informally. And as I noted in a recent article I wrote for the Post Millennial, Yaniv has already presented to city council 10 times this year. So from January to July 2019, they've presented to city council 10 times. And I think really only people who have a lot of idle time uh, can go in front of city council to do things like asking for a topless pool party with 12 year olds and no parents allowed. Um, or asking for money to help them run in a beauty pageant that they eventually dropped out of. So this behavior, when you put it all together, just screams unemployed person. So the unfairness is in how Yaniv deliberately targeted 16 female estheticians who have jobs providing waxing services, and he's just this unemployed guy who is trying to mess with the work and the livelihoods of these women. So this unemployed guy is attacking these women just trying to make money for themselves and their families who, and, and remember, these women did nothing wrong. Anyways, that's all I've got for now. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.